We interrupt this record to bring you a special bulletin. The reports of a flying saucer hovering over the city have been confirmed. Did you really go out with an alien? Uh-huh. What was it like? Real different. Becoming Human, a Mork and Mindy podcast. Hello, listeners. This is Paula Schefter with episode 39, A Mommy for Mindy. This is one of the few episodes with Mindy's name in the title, and it's a callback to the first season episode, A Mommy for Morky, although it's a very different plot. This first aired on January 3rd, 1980, which was not only the first Mark and Mindy episode of the 80s, although of course filmed in the 70s, but they were back on Thursday nights. The IMDb synopsis is, Mork is overjoyed when Fred returns and announces that he's remarried. But for Mindy, it dredges up painful memories of her mother's death. This was the 30th episode directed by Howard Storm and the 11th written by April Kelly. There's a sunny daytime exterior of the house with snow on the ground. Mindy and Mork are both dressed for tennis, but she's got sort of like a tracksuit on while he's in his usual orange and black striped shirt and suspenders, but with white shorts that show his legs. She asks how he liked his first tennis game. He says his favorite part was jumping over the net. She says the winner jumps over the net, which is why he collided with Mr. Clayton. And I don't know who Mr. Clayton is. They could have just had him collide with Mr. Bickley. Mark says tennis is different all over the universe. On Spurious 4, everyone has 16 arms, and Tennis Elbow is the number one killer. She didn't know they had tennis on other planets. He says only on planets with gravity. He acts out playing tennis without gravity. Also on the Ovitz asteroid, so another mention of Ovitz, the winner gets to eat the loser. The bad players keep rice pilaf in their pockets. She says talk about your sudden death. She notices a telegram on the floor by the door. She wonders who it's from. Mark says on work, they always sign on the inside. She says it's the same thing on Earth. He says, wow, parallel evolution. First fire, then the wheel, now this. She opens the telegram and reads aloud, sit two extra places at dinner tonight. And remember, I hate carrots. Love, Dad. She's excited that Dad and Grandma are coming in. She keeps referring to it as coming in, like coming into Boulder, rather than coming over. And then, regrettably, Mork goes into a slave routine about Massa Fred and Missa Cora. The audience laughs. Mitty says they haven't seen her father and grandmother in about eight months. So I don't know if this is actually set in January, which would mean that they left in May. It seemed like they left sometime over the summer. Mork says that that's 2.9% of their lives so far, and this would make her, yes, about 23. Mork's age is a little bit fuzzier. There's the whole weirdness of the Orkin measurement of time. They both miss Fred and Cora. Mindy thinks of how her dad used to take them bowling, which we never saw. Mork says Fred wanted Mork to rest his head in the ball return. Mindy agrees that that happened. She says they've got to get the place cleaned up. She'll go to the store and buy some flowers. Mork says he can make his favorite dish for dinner, wiener's tartare. They can have it medium. And I thought this was interesting that he's progressed from bologna in the first season to cooking with wieners. She says she'll fix dinner. She wants him to do the dishes for her. So he does, that's right, comedic impressions of an Art Deco teapot, crystal stemware, and a crock pot waiting for some chicken and uses what the subtitles call a foreign accent. After she leaves, he tells one of her plants that he thought it was funny. There's a nighttime exterior of the house. As she's basting some meat, she says she's so excited that Dad and Grandma are coming in. She can't sit still, even though she's standing. He suggests that he tie her up, and she doesn't really react, but then someone knocks. She races to the door. Fred is there with the blonde woman. He yells surprise. Mort cries, oh, Daddy, and hugs him before Mindy can. When Fred and Mindy hug, he calls her honey, which he does quite a bit in this episode, and as he used to. Mort goes over to the blonde woman and asks, Granny, is that a new dress? Fred tells the kids that this is Kathy, and she's with the orchestra. Kathy says hi and says she feels as if she knows them both already. Mort calls her a psychic and a clairvoyant with ESP. Fred says close. She's a good listener. He talked her ear off about his little girl and his little, uh, Mork. It turns out Grandma is visiting Mindy's uncle in Boston. So I guess Mindy's mother had a brother who lives in Boston? Mindy asks how everyone is and tells them to come on in. 
they all sit down. Mark in the stage right chair, Mindy on that end of the couch, and Fred and Kathy on the other end of the couch. Fred says they'll catch up during dinner. First, he and Kathy want to tell the news. They got married yesterday. Kathy is played by Shelley Favarese, who was then 35, and she's still alive as of this recording at the age of 79. And she's had a very long career, most notably Donna Reed when she was a teenager, and then several years after Mark and Mindy, she was on Coach. At this time, she was about a year into her long run as an occasional character on One Day at a Time playing Francine Webster. She definitely would have been familiar to baby boomers, but even Gen Xers would have seen her in various roles on TV, as well as some movies she'd done, including a few Elvis movies. I think I was aware of her. She's still definitely a recognizable face. Both she and Conrad Janis are described as special guest stars in the closing credits. Her character is called Kathy McConnell, so we don't know what her maiden name is. Mark is so surprised about the news of their marriage that he yells and falls back in his chair. The audience laughs and applauds. He gets up and picks up the chair. He says congratulations, and he's sorry he doesn't have any rice. But here, Doritos are forever, and he takes a blade of them and throws some Doritos at Fred and Kathy. There's more laughter and applause. Kathy chuckles and says Fred did tell her that Mark was different. Is something wrong, honey? Oh, no, no. It, it, I mean, it's just a, it's a surprise. Well, honey, we didn't mean to leave you out, but it it all happened so quickly with Kathy and me, there just wasn't time. How did it happen? Uh, well, for six months, I was just another woodwind. <laughs> then we uh, both started to realize how perfect we are for each other. So it's not as if we're strangers. Uh, well, I'm really happy for you. It's uh, just caught me unprepared. I mean, I didn't give a chance to buy you a present. Honey, if you're happy for us, that's the best present we could get. We can definitely see Mindy's discomfort, although we don't yet know the reason for it. She's definitely trying to be polite, but she can't pretend to be happy. We do get a little bit of information about Kathy, at least that she's a woodwind in Fred's orchestra. When Mindy asks what she plays, she says it's the flute, so Mork says, if you got it, flout it. And then he does his bark laugh. Fred puts his arm around Kathy and says he feels like a million dollars. He's got a great job, a terrific wife, and a beautiful daughter. I thought it was odd that he would say beautiful as the quality he most admires about Mindy, but maybe he means inside and out. Mork says that he's also got lovable me. Fred says that that's the cloud around his silver lining. Fred hopes that Mork and Mindy will think of Kathy as part of the family. So I thought that was interesting that he wants not only Mindy to accept her, but Mork, and he sees Mork as part of the family. There's a cut to Mindy, again, looking uncomfortable. Oh, Mama. Oh, que faccia. Que dice, que ballad. I think Mork has done an Italian accent before, and I like the little que ballard joke about the actress, que ballard. You can see that Mork is immediately taken to Kathy, and he sees her as not just Mindy's mother, but his own mother. He says that now that he has a mom, he can do all those wonderful things. Kathy can cut his meat, take him to the barber shop, buy him little shirts and socks and things. As with Exeter's wedding, we get a mother showing up, and there's the idea of her treating a grown man like a little kid, although it's presented more benignly in this episode. Fred starts to scold Mork, but Kathy says it's okay. Oh, Min, now we have a real mom. <laughs> a new stepmother. What's the difference, Min? Oh, uh, well, it just means that Kathy's not Mindy's biological mother. Yes, I, I guess I'm a replacement. Oh, like sizzling. <laughs> Again, we can see how uncomfortable Mindy is about the situation, and she's emphasizing the difference between a mom and a stepmother, and they introduce the idea of Kathy being a replacement. Fred and Kathy will be honeymooning in Acapulco, but he wanted to stop here a few days so that Mindy and Kathy could get to know each other. And then there's another cut to Mindy. Mindy asks, so other than getting married, what have you been doing? And there's an awkward silence. Fred says he's been keeping her grandmother out of trouble. Kathy says that's not easy since she has a crush on the entire string section. And I don't know if those are all male musicians, but hey. Mark says sex and violins. He asks about the orchestra biz. Fred says it's great. He's been getting rave reviews for his interpretation of the bolero. 
Mark says, if it's Ravel, it's swell. And I'm not sure, but this might have been a reference to the movie 10, which came out on October 5th, 1979. I've never seen the whole movie, but apparently Bolero features in it. Mindy asks what they have planned while they're in Boulder. The first thing Kathy would like to do is see Fred's house. Fred is glad it hasn't sold yet, so that's the first of a few calls back to Morkville Horror. They're thinking of moving back here for good. That way you and Kathy could be like a real mother and daughter. <laughs> It's great. It's uh, terrific. Um, why don't we all have dinner? Din din. So Mindy looks not only uncomfortable, but surprised. Fred doesn't seem to get it, and it's clear that Mindy doesn't want Kathy as her mother. Mork briefly puts his head on Kathy's shoulder. He reports Fred saying din din on their way to the table. Mork says he's going to sit next to mom if Mindy doesn't mind. Then he asks if Kathy minds him calling her mom. She says that it's okay. Just don't ask her to push him around in a shopping cart. He bark laughs. And then he asks mom the chances of him getting a baby brother. Which is not impossible, though yes, Fred is not his dad. There's another nighttime exterior of the house and we can see snow on the ground. I think this is the first shot we get of Mindy's bedroom. Maybe it appeared in season one. I don't think we've seen anything of it in season two, and it would feature more as the series went on, particularly after Mark and Mindy got married. There's a lot of white furniture, including a big bed, and I thought that was interesting that although Mindy is single, she has a big bed. She's in her pajamas. There's a knock, and Mindy says to come in. Mark is in his usual red and white sleepwear. He covers his eyes as he sees that she She's in bed, but she says it's okay. He asks if she's all right. She says she just thought she'd come in here and think a little. So I don't know if maybe after Fred and Kathy left, Mindy turned in earlier than usual. Mark comes over and sits sideways on the bed next to her. He's too excited to sleep. It's not every day an orkin gets a mother. She says, a stepmother. A real mother is the first one you ever have. He says Kathy is the first mother he's ever had. So he's not really counting the test tube experience as a real parent and child relationship. He's been looking through all of Mindy's gift catalogs, Fredericks and Spiegel. So again, the thing of Mindy having lingerie and Mork finding this interesting. He's trying to find a wedding present. Mindy says she's sure he'll find something nice. He says it can't be just nice. It has to be super nice for our folks. She tells him good luck and she'll talk to him in the morning. He gets up and says he wants to get something for both Fred and Kathy. Maybe a negligee built for two. Mindy says that they'll like that and she says good night. I think even if Mindy was more comfortable with her father remarrying, talking about him sharing lingerie with her stepmother would be uncomfortable. She snuggles into bed like she's going to go to sleep and he turns out the light. Then he turns it back on and says he's so happy he wants to buy a box of cigars that say, it's a mom. She says goodnight again and he turns out the light again. But he comes back, turns on the light and suggests getting them a wire haired terrier. It would be a great pet and they could use it to do the dishes with and then he does a little routine on that. He turns the light off and then back on and he tells her goodnight and then he turns the light off for good. We don't get an exterior of Fred's house, although we have seen that in the past, including on Markville Horror. And instead, there's a dissolve to Fred's living room. Because Fred has such old-fashioned furniture, this feels like a much earlier era, like the 30s or the 40s at the latest, although we'll see that this dream sequence must be set in the mid-60s. Fred is on the couch with his hands over his mouth. He's got fuller and darker hair. He's not wearing a jacket, but he does have a loosened tie. A little girl in a nightgown and pigtails enters from the side door. She's holding a teddy bear. She says she's hungry and she wants waffles. Fred, as if struggling to speak, says, Good morning, honey. I'll go fix you some. She says that mommy makes them better. He has her sit next to him on the couch. He tells her that mommy's been sick and she hasn't always been able to play with her. Mindy nods. He says that the angels felt bad that mommy was sick. Hesitantly, he tells her the angels took mommy to a place where she won't ever have to feel sick again. Mindy stands and says that when they bring mommy back, Fred should tell her that Mindy wants waffles for breakfast. Holding up the teddy, she says, and some for Mr. One-Eye. And I feel like we did have Mr. One-Eye the teddy bear in some other episode. It kind of just rang a bell for me. Honey, mommy can't make you any waffles. She's in heaven. I'm waiting in Mommy's chair until they bring her back. 
Why don't you call the angels and tell them I'm hungry? Oh, sweetheart. <sighs> I know this isn't easy, but you have to understand. Mommy isn't coming back. I'll go fix you some waffles and some for Mr. One-Eye. This scene just shatters me whenever I watch it. At the time, watching it today, I just started sobbing, even taking notes. I cried a little bit. As I've mentioned for other episodes, my mother died when I was three. When a sitcom has a plot about a motherless little girl, it really hits me, especially if it's done well. And this is heartbreaking for Fred as well, because he's obviously trying to hold it together and be strong and warm for his little girl. Mindy, who's probably six or seven, is trying to process the reality of death. I thought that Missy Francis, who plays little Mindy, who turned seven a few weeks before this episode aired, gives a nice performance, very believable, both as this child going through a difficult time and as the younger version of Mindy. This was, of course, an early role for her, and her career did continue until 2012, but it was mostly in the 80s. I think they easily could have had her back on Mork and Mindy. And we fade from this little girl wanting her mommy to Mindy as an adult, waking up with these intense feelings. If you grieve for somebody, you can be triggered by a memory or a dream or just a moment. You can feel with the intensity of the time of that loss. I thought Pam Dauber conveyed that really well. And then we get the beauty of Mark comforting her. I assume he was still in the living room looking at catalogs and he heard her crying out in her sleep. She can be vulnerable with him. She knows him well now and, and he's there for her. And in a different way than Fred, he is being strong and warm. We also have the motif of Mindy's mother's rocking chair, which we saw in Morkville Horror, which will pay off in this episode. And it is an intimate, although not sexual, bedroom scene, and I think one of the most important in the series. But we go to commercial break, and when we come back, there's a nighttime zoom in on the upper floor of Mork and Mindy's house. I think a few minutes have passed because now Mindy is sitting up in bed and she's got a tissue to dry her face and Mork is sitting next to her. Mindy says it was just awful. She remembered exactly how she felt the day that her mother died. Mork says that that was a long time ago. I'm guessing like 15 or 16 years. Now Mindy has a perfectly good mom just waiting to be used. He doesn't understand why she's not happy. She says she wants to be happy and she is happy for her father. <laughs> But it just seems awkward to have somebody suddenly walk in your life and say, well, Mindy, here, here's your new mom, just as good as the old one. I don't think your father was saying that Kathy could take your mom's place. I, I just think your father's a need for someone in his life again. He just wants you to like her. Oh, I know. I'm just being stupid. I mean, you don't have to be an idiot to see what this is all about. What's this all about, Mindy? <laughs> well, they say sometimes when a, a father remarries, the, the daughter feels threatened by the other woman. Why, because she was wearing exploding underwear? <laughs> Fruit of the boom? <laughs> Not that kind of threatened. It's more like being afraid that the, the other woman is going to take your father's love away from you. Oh. Is this jealousy, Mint? Really, I guess I am a little jealous. Yeah. Wow. I thought you told me once, though, that earthlings can love more than one person. And, like, when I came into your life, you said that you didn't stop loving your father any less. Well, that's because you didn't marry my father. <laughs> I am a little jealous, but not enough to make me feel this bad. I don't know what I feel. Maybe we should have a talk with your father, man to mend. <laughs> I 
think you're right, and, and the sooner the better. So we get her confiding in him and him trying to understand. She does a little Freudian analysis of herself about her jealousy of being replaced by another woman. We get the exploding underwear, fruit of the boom joke thrown in to lighten things a little bit, but it's still a pretty serious scene. And Mark says that Mindy told him that you can love more than one person. And then we get Mindy making the little joke about Mark marrying her father. And Mindy herself is confused by what she's going through. And I like that Mork suggests that she have a man-to-mend talk with her father. So this is one of those episodes where people are communicating badly, but they are trying. That doesn't always happen on sitcoms. Mork says that now that he has a mom, he wants to do all the kid things he never got to do, like grow a milk mustache, stay up late, and read comic books under the covers with a flashlight. And go for long rides in the car and ask, and then he does his kid voice, Are we there yet? Why did the Arabs raise the price of oil, Dad? So again, we're getting the thing of the Arabs and oil, which will be a running joke, although based on the news throughout this season and possibly into the next season. I think it's interesting that Mork is seen having a mother as a way to allow him to have the childhood he never got growing up on Ork. And it's funny that he didn't feel that way when he started to see Fred as Pops. Somehow having a mother is different for him than having a father. Mindy's examples of doing kid things are falling down and skinning your knees and having somebody tell you there's no such thing as the tooth fairy, which are not particularly happy kid experiences. And presumably they're ones that she had with her father comforting her. Mort processes the thing about the Tooth Fairy and leans against the wall as if he's dealing with this upsetting news about the Tooth Fairy. She has an amused but sympathetic expression as if she's thinking, Aw, Mork. We fade to the next scene, although there's again no exterior of Fred's house. We're back in the living room, present day, same furniture, except that it's covered with white drop cloths. Fred and Mindy are folding up the white cloth that was on the couch. Mindy says that Mork and Kathy really seem to be hitting it off. He says a little better than her and Kathy. Mindy says she's glad they're not here right now because she'd like to talk about this. He says he'd really like to talk about it too. As they sit on the couch, he says that she seems to be having problems with the situation. She admits she is. Dad, why didn't you tell me you were getting married? Well, honey, I, 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 there were so many arrangements, and, and we were so busy, and... You could have called. Yeah, you're right, I could have. I'm sorry, honey. I just wish that I had been given a little time, and everything was just sort of thrown at me. And to tell you the truth, Dad, it was kind of like you'd completely forgotten about Mom, like she never existed. Oh, honey, I'll never forget your mother. She was the first woman I ever loved. I remember, I remember the way her hair smelled, her laugh, her voice. Every detail about her is burned into my memory. I remember she used to grind her teeth in her sleep and it drove me crazy. After she was gone, I missed that sound so much. Oh, Dad, I'm sorry. Honey, never think I've forgotten your mother. But I also never forgot what it was like to, to be a husband and... and <laughs> that's what I can have again with Kathy. Look at the two of us. <laughs> this should be one of the happiest days of your life, and we're acting like it's a funeral. <laughs> I know, you're right. Come on, come on, let's get this, let's get this place cleaned up. One thing I like about this episode is that both Fred and Mindy are wrong, but they're both coming from a good place. He should have told her that he was going to get married, probably brought it up once he realized it's getting serious with Kathy. It still would have been a shock, but Mindy would have had time to process it a little bit before Fred showed up with Kathy, especially because she was looking forward to seeing her grandmother as well. And Mindy knows she's having a hard time being happy for him, and she wants to be, but she's not there yet. We get Fred's tribute to his late wife. 
it's just the sweetness of this father-daughter scene. It made me especially glad that Conrad Janis is back. This show has missed him. Not just his dry humor and his prickly relationship with Mork, but the whole dynamic of what he has with Mindy and that he was playing grief in the earlier scene. He's showing that Fred will never forget his wife. She'll always be a part of him. There just hasn't been anybody to give us this. Nobody that could give us this on the show after he left. And it's just a reminder of what fools ABC had at the top of the network or whoever made the stupid decisions that were made at the beginning of season two. Here we are. The 80s are beginning. They're trying to set things right again. And this episode helps with that just even it's a cliche and I've seen this in Dear Abby but Comrade Janus sells the thing of missing the sound of his wife grinding her teeth and there's a similar scene in Good Will Hunting where the Robin Williams character talks about his late wife farting in her sleep it's funny and poignant at the same time and this is this show's version of that fred and mindy uncover mindy's mother's rocking chair mindy promises not to act like a jerk fred says if only he could hear those words from work mindy says dad you like him and you know it he says yes unfortunately so i thought it was interesting that they are playing up the thing of fred's mixed feelings about work and just like with cora he can be fond of people but still make fun of them and be irritated by them but he does consider mork to be family mindy uncovers the other chair and then mork comes in he says kathy is parking the car he tells pops he really approves of his choice they are three lucky people, meaning himself, Mindy, and Fred. He sets down a small pink box he carried in. Kathy enters and tells Mork he shouldn't have got out until she stopped the car. She goes over and gives Fred a quick kiss. Mork says he was just in a hurry to report. He says that he gave Kathy a cultural tour of Boulder. He took her to the theater in the mall. Mindy says there isn't one. He says it's a little theater. Kathy says actually it's a puppet show. Mark says they were doing Shakespeare's Punch and Hamlet. And he does a little bit of that. And the other characters laugh. Then they went to see an art film, War of the Worlds. I assume that that was the 1953 version because the later War of the Worlds movies had not yet been made. Kathy asks why Mork rooted for the Martians. Mork says they're a much maligned people. Fred says he told Kathy that Mork is a little eccentric. Here we get a hint that Kathy is not in on the secret of Mork being an alien. From what I recall, she never finds out. Then Mork took Kathy to the delicatessen. Remo and Jeannie didn't believe Kathy was his mom. He says mom just laughed, and then she does the bark laugh. Mork says that's what got them free desserts. He opens the box and shows it to Fred and Mindy. It's cannoli. This is both Kathy and Mindy's favorite dessert. Mork's favorite is spaghetti a la mode, which I have to say sounds awesome. Mindy says Mork is on the Weight Watchers hit list. Everyone takes a pastry and Kathy sits in the rocking chair. Mindy tells her not to sit there. Kathy stands. Fred and Mork look at each other like they know what's going on with the chair. Mindy hesitantly says that that was her mother's chair. Kathy stutters an apology and Mindy stutters one back. Everyone looks at Mindy with concern. She apologizes again and says she just has to work a few things out. She apologizes yet again, then she exits. Mort goes to the front door and tells friend Kathy that Mindy just signaled for help. That really melted my heart, that he can now read her well enough and he can step up and he's going to go comfort her. But he's also going to help her work through her confusion. There's a cut to Kathy and she looks both concerned and confused. It's implied that she and Fred will talk about this. And I just want to mention that the music in this episode really emphasizes the emotions. There's a fade to daytime exterior of the Mork and Mindy house, and Mork and Mindy are sitting on opposite ends of the couch. Oh, Mork. At first I thought it was just that I was, I was angry because I thought my father had forgotten about my mother. Oh, but he hasn't. He just wants a chance for a little happiness himself. I just don't understand why I keep getting in the way of that. Mork says they tried all the earthly reasons. Now it's time for Ork and psychology. He has Mindy lie on the couch, but on Ork, they strap the couches to your back. She lies with her head resting on the couch arm. He sits in a nearby chair and takes out his shiny notebook that we've seen in other episodes. He starts with free association. Night. Day. Black. 
white, red, yellow. But he thinks that's the wrong answer, and he laughs triumphantly. He says, one for him. I don't know what the right answer would have been for red. He says she should tell him everything he can remember about her mother. She says that could take hours. He needs to give her something more specific. He makes a note, ooh, uncooperative patient. He asks what her mother looked like. Her mother had brown hair and was tall, taller than a tabletop. He writes, furniture fixation. Her mother had blue eyes like hers. And then she tries to think of other details. He says the patient can't remember what her mother looked like. Mindy sits up and puts her feet on the floor. She says she's not so crazy about your orkin psychology, which I think was a bit of a Mindy dad joke. He says lucky her, it's almost over. He asks what she remembers most about her mother. She says the terrible pain she felt when she realized that her mother was never coming back. Mark says maybe that's why she's afraid to test drive a new mother. And so we get the humorous thing of test driving. It's also an insight. Mark says that when he was a little boy, he had an electric chicken because of course chickens are an important part of Orkin culture. He tried to pet it with wet hands and it shocked the Shaw's bot out of him. He never wanted to do that again. So I thought that was nice that we again got Shaw's bot as the Orkin version of the S word. Mindy says there's a big difference between electric chickens and mothers. Mork says that they both got burned. So I thought that was like a really dark joke, but also insightful. Mindy says he could be right. Maybe she doesn't want another mother if the mother's just going to be taken away from her. As he sits beside her on the couch, he again says that he never had a mother. He's not going to blow his chance now, even if he has to give her up one day. Mindy says it's going to take some getting used to. Mork says that she and Kathy have a lot of time. Mindy agrees. You know, there is one thing I remember about my mother. Whenever I had a problem or I hurt, she'd always put her arms around me and that would always make everything just fine. Yeah, that's real nice. You never had anything like that, did you? No, uh, it's kind of hard to cry on a test tube shoulder. <laughs> Most of the time you go and you'd slide down. <laughs> We've got him trying to understand the comfort of a mother's hug and her sympathizing that he never had that. And then again, we get some humor mixed in because the thing about the test tube. There's a knock and Mindy says to come in. Kathy and Fred are there in coats. Fred says they just stopped by for a minute. They're on their way to the airport. Mindy says they thought they were going to stay for a couple days. And it's never clear exactly how long this visit was supposed to be. Fred decided that he couldn't wait to get to Acapulco and soak up that sunshine and those margaritas. And we have seen Fred drunk in the pilot, but we never got the impression he drinks much. Then Kathy admits that she feels that she's disrupted something. It may be best if she and Fred leave a little earlier. Mindy says she's the one disrupting things. Kathy says no, but Mindy insists it's her fault. Mork says it's the old electric chicken syndrome, which would be, of course, a fabulous band name. Mindy, maybe part of the problem is that you're feeling pressure to accept me as your mother. But Mindy but should feel that you're a part of the... No, Fred, I'm not her mother. Maybe it'll be easier for you if you just think of me as a friend. I'll try. Well, if you're lucky, you can be both a friend and mother, a frother. <laughs> Kathy, I just want you to know that I'm, I'm really looking forward to the next time you and Dad are in town. And if you do decide to move into the old house, I know I'll be real happy to have a whole family here again. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Oh. Mm. Kathy, I hope you can forgive me. Oh, just like a real mom. <laughs> uh, mom, before you go, can we talk about an allowance? <laughs> So we get Kathy being understanding. She's offering friendship, but she is doing her best to be like a mother. I thought that the casting of Shelley Fabrice was really nice in a different way than with Georgia Engel. This is a familiar TV face, and so there's some comfort to that. She's very pretty in a girl next door kind of way, and so that makes her, I guess, more acceptable to the viewer. She's nice. She's got a bit of a sense of humor. We don't really find out too much about her, but she's likable. There's no sign that this is a bad person that Fred is connected with, as we saw in the episode where Mork imagined than the Connell's lives without him. We hope that she and Fred will be happy and they'll be good for each other. And so the casting is doing some of that work, but I do think that the performance helps. 
not a lot is asked of her later in the series, but she will pop up now and then. We never really saw Fred date much, and it wasn't that happily, so it's a nice happy ending for him, and it is good to have him and presumably Cora eventually moving back to town, although I don't know how that works out with the orchestra. And we also see here that Fred is happy, that his wife and his daughter are starting to connect. And Mindy is trying her hardest, and she is letting herself be comforted by Kathy and have that mother's hug. And Mark is touched by this, but there's also some humor thrown in with Brother and asking Kathy for an allowance. We're talking about why does Mark feel this way about Kathy and not about Fred. And I think because he and Fred started out with Fred being very antagonistic and the usual proto-father-in-law thing, like on that girl, Mork and Kathy don't have that baggage. She seems to be a very accepting person and she doesn't have the issue with Mork and Mindy living together. I don't know what Fred told her about Mork and Mindy's relationship, if he described Mork as a roommate or a boyfriend. I don't know if we ever find that out. But Kathy's pretty cool with it, you know, maybe because she is younger than Fred and a different generation, maybe a different attitude or just, you know, her different personality. There's a nighttime exterior of the house. Mark summons Orson. Orson asks if it was a good week. Mark says it was a very interesting week, relatively speaking. And speaking of relatives, he and Mindy have a new one. So again, Mark seeing this as Kathy is his mother, his family. Orson asks what's relative, and Mark says everything according to Einstein. But stay tuned and turn up your volume, because here comes the straight poop right at you. Like he's some weird DJ? I think this is at least the second reference Mork makes to Einstein, and I think Orkins know who Einstein is, even if they don't know what relatives are. And that seems weird too, because you know Mork has talked about siblings and parents and grandparents and so on, and I assume cousins because of Nelson. Mork says that there was a wedding in the family, and Mindy's father came home with a new wife. It caused problems for Mindy. Orson asks if she didn't like having a new mother. Mork says she didn't like having a replacement for the old one. Humans become very attached to their loved ones, and when they're gone, they cling to the memories. Orson says it sounds like Earthlings place great value on their past. Mork agrees. He says that memories are untouchable, and humans need to be touched. The nice thing is, sometimes you can have one without giving up the other. Among the various messages in these reports, this was one of the better ones. Then he says, on that high moral note, mein Hindenburg, because of course he has to get in a fat joke, Nanu Nanu. As you can guess, this episode was in many ways a palate cleanser and also putting me through the emotional ringer then and now. Obviously, at the time, I was utterly surprised to see Fred back and happy. I knew this was coming now, but it still hit me. It still got to me. Although you can quibble with the whirlwind romance of Fred and Kathy, they all do as well as they can with the situation, and it does give them something meaty to work with. This is another episode where I do not miss Remo, Jeannie, and Nelson, although it was nice that you can kind of picture Mork at the deli with Kathy. And we will get Nelson with his Uncle Fred later in the season, I believe. I rate each of these episodes on a 0 to 4 egg scale, which measures how well it delivers what I'm looking for in the series. I really, really wanted to give this a 3.5, but I felt like the humor didn't always land, particularly Mark's slave routine, the rushed nature of this whole situation. I went back and forth between a 3 and a 3.5. And I'm landing on 3 and a quarter. I do think it is one of the strongest episodes of season two, but it could be better. As far as the humor goes, we're still good in that thing of Mork acting like an actor or stand-up comic auditioning, and it just feels more forced than what we got in season one, where it just felt like a bubbling over of who he is and what he's experiencing. And now it's like, hey, let me perform for you. It's off-putting. That said, there's some lovely, lovely acting that he gets to do in support of Pam Dauber. She, as usual, is so good with the drama. I really think that she's underrated as an actress, although I haven't seen her in many other roles. I think just within this series, she is underrated, and there's just a lot of the gut-wrenching <laughs> of this episode comes from her, and I already talked about Comrade Janice. I do have to say they play off each other in such a real, believable way. He slides right back into this character, and I 100% buy it. 
And you can feel it that probably Pam and Robin miss Conrad too, not just that their characters did. Another one of those episodes where it's basically just four people, Mark and Mindy and one other couple, and they just go. I also liked that we got not exactly closure, but an update on the situation from the Morkville horror about Fred wanting Mindy to sell the house. Fortunately, she didn't. I also rate each of these episodes on a zero to four heart scale, which measures how well it promotes and supports the romantic relationship of Mork and Mindy. This was not a romantic episode for them. And even the thing about Fred's romance was more about parenthood although he does talk about wanting to be a husband again. Whether or not it's romantic, there is an incredible bond between Mark and Mindy in this episode. And even when he's teasing her and winning at word association, he is there for her. He is reading her signals. He is comforting her as much as he can, but he's also trying to be the voice of reason. He's patient with her and she trusts him. She doesn't open up to him when her father and Kathy are there, and even when she goes to bed and just says she wants to think some things over. But after the nightmare in memory of the day she learned her mother died, she shares that pain with him. That really got to me too. So I'm going with the two. As far as flirtiness goes, we get the continuing motif that Mark is interested in her lingerie. But basically it's more about these two people being there for each other. It could be a different sort of family. It could be platonic best friends. But I also feel that it is the basis for their own eventual marriage. Definitely recommend this episode. Not crazy about the first scene, but otherwise you need to watch it. It will help you understand the McConnells better and Mark's relationship to them. Three and a quarter eggs, two hearts. This is Paula Schaffner with episode 39, A Mommy for Mindy. Na new, na new mom. <laughs> Yeah.